Is it working? Is it working? Is it working? Oh, look, the thing's doing this wiggly bit. It's doesn't look like it wants to go on. Wow, is it on? I think so. Well, if anybody's there watching, apologies, apologies for uh, the machinery crapping out. I'm not quite sure what happened, really. It's a bit of a mystery. But um, we might be back on, we might not. I might be just talking to myself here. I might be uh, drinking very um, Quarantazorax by myself. But uh, Oh, yes, perhaps. you're back. Can you hear perhaps us? There's somebody Oops. there. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for hanging in. <laughs> You're probably the only person. <laughs> Hamilton <laughs> and, uh, Hambone Nelson. Hamilton Hambone Nelson. Thank you. I think it's just you and me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. David else. Grelly is here, too. Oh, wow. Oh. Well, poor old she who must be obeyed at all times has been doing battle with various apps and we've resorted to what everybody else does, which is just use a laptop computer. So you're not getting the, the benefit of all the lovely um, high-end audio and two cameras and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, here we are, and I appreciate you hanging in. I raise my glass to you Quarantinians who are still there online. And I'm going to keep going. We've lost ages, but we're going to just keep doing it. So uh, if anybody's got any questions, keep them coming, and I'll keep playing to you. And I hope for, hopefully the audio and video quality won't be too compromised and we can get uh, mike the engineer back next time i have to if walk we... in front of the camera now ah <laughs> a glimpse of she who must be obeyed at all times and believe me at all times the thing is now you can't read the um, questions no i can on this other computer because are you can you go on the other computer um, and you can read well, it? Well, maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Wonders of modern on, technology. While she's doing that, I'll play a little boogie boogie. <laughs> back on and um, I'm grateful to you all for hanging in there. Let the quarantine hour commence. I should point out that um, the glass might seem a little, what, little bit um, volume wise diminished since the last time. But it's, uh, there's, there's some in the thing. There's some in the thing. And there's oh, ice wow. cubes in the ice cube thing. All right, let's get this restarted properly. Hold on. Quarantine o'clock. Two ice cubes, cocktail shaker, give it a shake, and look at that, as if by magic, a Quantazarac appears on the piano. All right, back to the quarantine happy hour. Okay. Let's, Let's see. see. Got any questions, Trish? Uh, hold on, I'm still trying to get it together. Well, let's see. How about oh, how about Johnny's question, nephew Johnny? Ready? Yeah. It's a deep one. Okay. If there weren't any musical instruments in the whole world, how would you make music? Whoa, <laughs> that's a question from my nephew Johnny. Who? How old's Johnny? 11, 10, 15, 11, 43? <laughs> 10 going on 34. <laughs> Johnny, that's a really good question. Well, before they had musical instruments, I think they used to do stuff like this. Boom. Dooka, boom, boom, chicka, boom, boom. Dooka, ba-doom, boo, ba-doom, doo, doo. 
There's music in the streets. There's music in the air. A little old soul beating. They're dancing everywhere. Now I would tell the whole world. Now tell them if I could. Tip a little bit, whatever the words are, to make the song feel good. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, pardon me, but you can use it. We're gonna make a little music. We got soul, but don't you lose it. We're gonna make a little music. All oh, everything gonna be metal. Uh, we just gonna sing it a cappella. Everything gonna be metal. We just gonna sing it a cappella. Oh. If you don't have any musical instruments, you can still make music with your hands, with your legs. You can stomp and go. Bang all sorts of stuff. You can always make music. You don't need to have musical instruments. That's a really good question. Man. Okay, well, here's a question from before. Um, from John, I can't read my handwriting. I think it's John Kapek. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, as much uh, as much a fan I am about your music, your prose writing is special, especially the travel stuff you post. Can you reveal what reading and education fostered your prowess as a prose writer? It's a tongue twister. <laughs> uh, boy. Um, well, my mum taught me how to read when I was little before I went to school and I was an avid um, bookworm when I was a kid and I kind of went in and out for long periods of reading and not reading anything particularly. Um, but um, I enjoy the, uh, the privilege of having uh, English as a first language and, um, and I think it's a wonderful language to use. and. Uh, um, I write stuff and then I look at it and try and make it better and spend a lot of time think, well, we spend that much time at it. But I just like good writing and uh, I was a pretty lousy student at English. Um, I never went to university or anything. I left school when I was 16. So um, I don't really know what the answer is to that really. I think I, stuff that interests me that I write about on the silly little Facebook post I do is stuff that seems to appeal to um, people who are on the same page as me, or more likely to, than anybody else to have joined my Facebook world. So I guess we're all, you know, digging the same kind of stuff, really. All right, ready for another one? Yeah. Walter Galliazzi says, hello, Walter John. Walter Galliazzi says, hello, Walter. Hello, John, greetings from Argentina. Which musician, who influenced you the most? I've seen your show at Ronnie Scott's and it was incredible. Thank you, Walter. Well, um, musicians that influenced me the most. Well, first, my dad. Um, family parties he would play. My dad taught my uncle. And uh, my uncle showed me some really hip stuff. One of the first things he showed me was the sax riff on Honky Tonk by Bill Doggett, he goes. He showed it to me on the guitar. Um, my dad, my uncle John, my uncle Bruce was a huge influence. Um, so family, first and foremost, and Steve, my uncle Steve, says my cousin really, Steve Simpson. Um, piano wise, biggest influence on me, I think, was Mac Rebernack, really. I loved what he did with the piano, and that was the main reason I came to New Orleans, was to try and learn where he got that style from. And um, that was kind of a long journey. And I was lucky because I got to see Alan Toussaint, and they became, you know, Alan became friend of mine and I got to see James Booker, all the guys that Matt Rebernack really liked. Got to see Toots Washington, who was an influence on Professor Longhair. Sadly I didn't see Professor Longhair. He died 
shortly before I arrived. Uh, it was when I was a little kid, I used to say my ambition was to see Professor Longin in the evenings. He died uh, before I got here. But I didn't see Huey P. M. Smith. So um, they were the big influences on me, piano wise. You know, I liked Taj Mahal when I was a kid, you know, in England growing up. It was hard to get records. I grew up in the country, there's a record shop in the village. Um, but you couldn't get the obscure records. The obscure records I found in the record collections of my family members and their friends. Um, Chuck Lavelle is an influence on my piano play. He plays with the Rolling Stones now. But he was with the Allman Brothers band. He was, he was a great piano player. Billy Payne from Little Feet. I mean, I like that funky kind of thing. and stuff and they all dabbled in that and then you know the nice you know <laughs> um, the blues piano players yeah a whole bunch of people there. but there's some of them for you all right this is a question from dom clark and somebody else asked this before we went kaput before um Please tell us about where Brother I'm Hungry came from. <laughs> Brother I'm Hungry. Ah, well, Brother I'm Hungry, there's a song that changed course in the middle. It was written when I lived in, when I was living, for, I lived for two years in New York. Um, I moved from New Orleans on the spur of the moment wound up in New York um, and was hustling, basically. And there was a point at which I'd done some demo recordings and someone had arranged for me to go and meet a big wig from a major record label. And it was, um, it was odd, you know, I went to this, got in the elevator, I went up to, to the top whatever floor it was, and eventually I meet this guy, which I can't remember what his name was or what record label was, it doesn't really matter. But um, I played songs for him, and the guy just seemed to me to be a complete idiot. And um, it was a <laughs> biblical expression, casting pearls before swine. And I found the whole exercise so humiliating, having to try and justify or explain myself or validate myself musically to someone who I could tell didn't have a musical bone in his body. He was a sycophantic uh, kind of music business person, record company person. And it just the whole thing was very strange. And so I went home and wrote this very bitter song um, just as a cathartic exercise. And I thought, no, this is no good. There's no point in doing this. But I like the actual stuff that I come up with. I like these changes. the song away the song idea was good so i just had to, to get out of my little funk and change the, the um point the whole thing in a different direction scrub out all that stuff and turn this little uh thing into something positive positive. and at that time in new york there were a lot of homeless people you couldn't walk out of your front door without finding somebody rummaging through the trash and um there was just, it just struck me it was so sad you know you had to just say you know, I, mean, I was broke as well struggling and i didn't have any money you always had a few coins in your pocket but not enough to give to everybody and you found yourself in this unfortunate situation having to try and decide who was who you're going to give your quarter to 
who was more <laughs> most worthy of your quarters, someone that was more desperate seemed to, to merit it more. And it struck me at that time, because I was living from hand to mouth, from gig to gig, that it would be so easy to uh, have one or two misfortunes and somehow slip down a couple of rungs and suddenly slide down the ladder and lose where you lived and lose this out of the other and how easy it is to slide down how hard it is to get back up and um, that's really what the song was about brother i'm hungry and i can't the lord do it was i can't afford to eat and john porter who produced the record said eventually i can't afford not to eat <laughs> i thought that's more poignant <laughs> so yeah brother i'm hungry all right this um question came in before but i thought it was a good one um, Phil, I'm going to butcher your last name. I'm sorry. Phil Mizjowiec. It's a Polish name, it looks like. Do you have a favorite piano either at home or in a venue? And is there a story behind it? Um, well, there have been various clubs I've played over the years that had pianos that I really liked. There used to be, uh, it might even still be there. We used to go over and play in Switzerland at a club in Lausanne called the Grand Casino. And they had a white Yamaha that was really, really funky. Yamaha Grand Piano, same size as this one here, same model, but it must have had really hard hammers because it was great for playing, you know. <laughs> the spiky hammers gave it the feel of a clavinet and so often pianos do uh, very hard to find one piano that does everything really really well but i must say i think the nicest the piano that i loved the most of, um, of all the pianos that i played one that sticks out in my memory was liberace's old baldwin concert grand piano which um when I played, it was housed at the Gibson showroom in Los Angeles. And after Katrina, uh, I did a couple of things in there for various people who were using uh, that space to, to, to do videos to try and uh, help the victims or people who'd suffered uh, losses in Hurricane Katrina and what. And I was, I was uh, we were we evacuated up to Los Angeles. Um, and that piano, oh, I love that piano. It's an old Baldwin. From the, I guess it was from the 60s or 70s. It was covered in uh, mirrors and all sorts of tacky Liberace stuff that you'd expect. But boy, I was playing Liberace's piano. And actually, I don't know if anybody noticed, but when we started this thing, the first thing I played was the tune that Liberace used to end his shows with. It's a song that I actually heard um, James Booker play. I learned from hearing James Booker do it. There was a song called I'll Be Seeing You, which for uh, perhaps some of the older listeners was a song that actually has resonance for the people that um, lived through the Second War. And I'll Be Seeing You is actually a beautiful song. It's a very poignant song. Um, and it really speaks to the a certain sense of desolation, but spirit in the face of adversity. And it simply says, you know, I'll be seeing you in the old familiar places when we get to the other end of this thing. And of course, at the time it was written, they were talking about the Second War, but it seemed fairly apropos. And it occurred to me that perhaps I should end all of these. But I'll be seeing, I'll play you a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. 
and seeing you in all the old familiar places. Another question? Yeah. All right. So Scott Peake says, if you could pick one person you haven't played with that you would like to. Scott asked if there's one person I could play with that I haven't played with that I'd like to play with. Well, there are several, of course. But um, one. Yes, there is one. And I'll tell you, because when I was coming up, very hungry for information and um, in a little country village, as I mentioned earlier on, with uh, a record shop before the internet, when uh, information was scarce, it was really hard to find out stuff. And I was very impressed by four people in particular, four musicians that were the same generation as my uncles, my aunt, who were, who were about 10 years older than me. I was in, you know, when they were 25, I was 15. And, um, there were four artists who, whose records were available and these people were digging into the vaults and going back and were an educate. They were a source of information. Dr. John, Bonnie Raitt, Taj Mahal and Rai Kuda. And they were, I, I idolized, idolized them when I was little, uh, little, when I was you know, 11, 12 years old, 13 years old. Um, and I listened to all the records and uh, digested all this stuff. And I got to later on, you know, I can't believe how lucky I am because I was in Bonnie Raitt's band and I was in Taj Mahal's band and I was in Dr. John's band. But I've never actually ever met Rai Kuda. I've never got to play with him, but I have huge respect for Rai Kuda. And, um, and perhaps one day our paths will cross. Who knows? But I'm a big fan. So yes, that's somebody. You want some um, requests? Some requests, yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, some from before. Just because. Let's get low down. When you get back, help me. Help me, somebody. So damn good. <laughs> Unnecessarily mercenary. Should have medley of all of them yeah. somehow. <laughs> well, I will. But there is one I want to play, and this is uh, a request for John Hyman because he he uh, asked for it last week, and I didn't get around to. To doing it. So we'll do some of them. Well, I can't play them, but I play these little snippets from some of them. So let's start with one for John. This one's uh, Brickyard Blues. I'm not sure how this is going to sound because it's being picked up on the, you know, we've lost all our lovely. You, you don't have to talk into the microphone anymore. No, either. I don't. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know. I know. I wonder if anybody can actually even hear what I'm saying anyway. Well, I tried to run my gates and set my name That's the same old pain I heard before I'm too tired to go for the show again and again I tried to explain, I said, man Help me somebody. Yeah. Let me transpose it down. Show you bully 
to she who must be obeyed at all times. <laughs> she was so badly, you. <laughs> yeah, struggling with the bloody Facebook crashing catastrophe and valiantly <laughs> rebooting and reshuffling and looking for passwords and turning things on and off. Oh, thank you. Know, That's very nice. Help me somebody. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was uh, just testing the, um, I have to keep thinking what it's called. What's this one? It's a it's a Quarantazarac. Quarantazarac. Um, what else is on that list? Oh, there was a little bit of. She loved it far when I was riding from home. She dug it even better. Going long distance on the phone. Cool and sexy. Getting the postcard from Brazil. Oh, and I should bet. Don't you want to get? The cheap. When you get back, we're going to tie tie all night long. Cause she loves me. When you get back, we're going to sing a different song. I flew in on the way out to the car, looking for the phone in. Voice said, leave a message. Cause there ain't nobody home. Thank you. 
And um, <clears throat> that was with James Singleton on bass, Terence Higgins played drums, Bonnie and Mac Rebernack sang on it. Mac played guitar, I played piano. And I asked Mac if he would um, sing when we were doing the vocals. I said, Can you sing this part? And he said, Oh, well, all right then, all right. How's it going? And I sang him the part and he, on, this, on this piano, he went over and. I think I was asking him to go, let's get low down. And he's going, all, all right, let's get and he, and he tried and he was singing this other part. He said, stop it, let me let me get it again, do it again. So he said, man, he said, I never was no good at homogenizing. <laughs> <laughs> homogenizing. So Mac didn't, he didn't homogenize, he just did his Mac croaky thing that was killing. And um, so anyway, yeah, that song. Yeah, any more questions? One more question? Yeah, keep yeah. going for a minute, right. yeah, because we All lost right. some time. So let's just keep All going. Right. People want to listen, I'll just keep, I'm enjoying this actually. Yeah, you're just getting warmed up now. All right, so Rose Hudson says, John, I saw you at Jazz Fest one year and you mentioned to me about listening to Bobby Womack and New Orleans greats like Snook Eaglin. What would you say you learned from them? I learned loads from them, like I learned loads from everybody, you know. I've done, just a sponge basically i just go out there and just try and find killing people with lots of soul and and try and soak some of it up and uh, if you just keep doing that then the hope is that some of it will come out somewhere you just absorb it all and it gets into your machine becomes part of the the grease and the wheels and um it'd be hard to to um identify one or two kind of uh, tangible things i mean i think with those two examples particularly bobby womack and snooks eaglin um it was just a soul i mean i don't know there's no the, the, whatever that is that's the closest um that we'll get to finding a, a word that kind of sums it up and it only means anything because it's applied to certain people who are really soulful. But Snooks Egan was so soulful. When he played, when he sat like Bobby Womack, they seemed to somehow like tap deep down to the core of the earth and tap into some seam of something so rich, some inspiration that it imbued every note and added value to every inflection so that 